Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. For tonight's webinar, we will be learning all about the bugs in your garden, the good ones and the bad ones. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for um, being here today and allowing me to share some of your Tuesday evening with you. As I talk about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is insects. Some of you are probably going, well, the guy's nuts. No, I'm just a biology guy. And maybe I am nuts, but that's another story. But what I am is enthusiastic about insects. Now, whether you have the same enthusiasm at the end, I don't know. But what I hope you'll get is learn a few things that you didn't know and maybe have a different appreciation for the creatures around us. The goals I have tonight are pretty straightforward. I want to introduce to you some of the very basic insect biology. And I say very basic. You do not have to be a scientist to understand this. But it's good that we understand a little bit about how these creatures function. I want to introduce some of the common good bugs and the bad bugs that you're going to probably find in your garden this summer. I want to introduce to you the concept of integrated pest management is not nearly as onerous as it sounds. It's a strategy. It's just a way of long-term pest prevention in an eco-friendly way. And at the end, I'm going to show you how to find the various management options. If I don't talk about them, I'm going to give you the ways that you can find out how to manage specific pests in your garden. I want to start with kind of a, uh, a historical perspective. I was in Egypt uh, a few years ago. And being a science geek, I noticed right away that on many of the walls and facades and obelisks, there was an indicator of a, or indication, a depiction of a scarab beetle. Scarab is just shorthand for the scientific name or group that this beetle belongs to. It's a scarabiidae, but it's called a scarab. And here you could see it in part of a hieroglyphic. And you can see it very clearly depicted here. But the one that really stuck with me is this one. This came from, was on the wall of the tomb of Ramses IV. And it was from almost 3,000 years ago. And it's the scarab that seems to be holding on to or doing something with a ball. We now know what this is, is this scarab is called a dung beetle. And the dung beetle lays its eggs, the, the female lays her eggs in little pieces of dung or mud, and then she rolls them balanced on her front foot. The same kind of depiction that you're seeing here. The ancient Egyptians watched this and they likened the movement of these balls of mud or dung as the movement of the sun across the heavens. And they said the scarab was a manifestation of a sun god called Kepri. It's really a fascinating story. Read about it if you're interested. The reason I'm showing you this is to highlight something. If it's a historical text, a theological text, a scientific text, or the wall of an ancient tomb, insects have always been part of the human narrative. And I think it's incumbent upon us to understand more about them because they live with us in the ecosystem called home. So I want to kind of give you that feeling as we go through this tonight. So how many of them are there? Most of you said, boy, a lot of them. And that's true. If you count up every single plant on earth and every single animal, big and small, on earth, half of them will be insects. I say multicellular organisms. I exclude bacteria and viruses. We know too much about viruses these days. These are just all the plants and animals. That's a lot. The Smithsonian, through ways that I haven't a clue of, they estimated that there were 10 quintillion individual insects alive. That's a, a, a quintillion is a billion billion. Now you look at that number there and it's hard to fathom that number. How can we really appreciate that? I was trying to understand the universe or infinity. Other scientists, which may be too much time on their hand, guesstimated there were 300 pounds of insects for every pound of human on Earth. 
Another thing, well, well, that's kind of odd. Let's put it in a personal perspective. Here I am. You have to admit my sartorial choices are pretty grand. This is me and my Farmer Bob outfit and my my uh, my presentation in the Master Gardener class. We give a formal presentation. Here I am. I'm on one side of a scale. How many insects am I worth given this equation, if you will, on the top? And the answer is 28.5 tons. Now, I don't expect you to remember the numbers, but I want you to remember that there sure are a lot of them. And because there are a lot of them, they are the most diverse group of animals on the planet. This small montage shows just some of the differences in shapes and size and texture. You can get drab ones, you can get brightly colored ones, you, ones that run, crawl, hop, swim, fly, eat animals, eat plants. They're very diverse. They're very beautiful in their bizarre sort of way. And they're part of our ecosystem. So we need to appreciate and understand them more. So what distinguishes an insect? <clears throat> Scientists like to group animals or plants according to similarities. They put all, all the horses together and all the redwood trees together. And they put a group of animals together called arthropods. Arthropoda, I'm sure many of you know, remember your Greek. And arthropoda means jointed toe. All the arthropods are characterized by heavily jointed legs like this. Spiders are arthropods, they have eight legs. Pill bugs, roly polies are arthropods, they have 14 legs. Crabs are arthropods, they have 10 legs. Another characteristic of arthropods is that their skeleton is on the outside of the body. Like this beetle, it's called a zigzag beetle, by the way. And the exoskeleton is called an elytra on a beetle. I only mention that name because I'm going to use that word in a minute. It's this, this part of the exoskeleton here. When the beetle wants to fly, the, the elytra opens, the wings come out, and they fly away. So all the arthropods have heavy jointed legs and the exoskeleton. Think of the Dungeness crab. If you want to think about exoskeleton, you have to beat it with a mallet in order to get to the meat of the legs. So the insect has a head and a thorax where the legs come out and an abdomen, but it has those other characteristics and it has three pair of legs. It has six legs. Now tonight, I'm only talking about the six legged creatures. I'm not going to talk about roly polies or mites or ticks or spiders, just the insects. So my last bit of biology, if you will, that I want to share with you is about the, the concept of metamorphosis. Now, somewhere in your educational life, grammar school, middle school, um, high school, college, somewhere you were introduced to the concept of metamorphosis. You may not remember that term because you don't use it. I learned it in the concept of a frog. Frog lives in the water. The frog lays its eggs in the water. A couple of weeks later, out pops the tadpoles. We used to call them polywogs. The polywogs swim around eating algae. And a few weeks later, you start seeing hind legs developing. After that, a few weeks more, the front legs develop. They start losing their gills and developing lungs. And in a few weeks later, out pops a little tiny but fully developed frog. Metamorphosis is this conspicuous and abrupt, abrupt change or transformation from the immature forms, like the polywogs, into the adult form. We as human beings do not undergo metamorphosis, but some animals do and insects do. And it's really kind of important, and I hope I can explain why it's important. There's two types of metamorphosis that insects uh, go through, one of which is called complete. The adult lays her eggs and the eggs hatch into what is called a larva. The larva doesn't look at all like mom. The larva does whatever it's destined to do. It eats plants, it eats animals, it does whatever it does until it's ready to finally become an adult and it forms a pupa. If it was a butterfly, it would be called a chrysalis. If it was a moth, it would be called a cocoon. Those are all pupa. And the development continues in the pupa. And then 
out emerges an adult. That's complete metamorphosis. Another way they do it is called partial or incomplete, which is exactly the same, but different. I almost like that kind of description. The female lays her eggs. This time the eggs hatch into what are called nymphs. They're called instar nymphs. And depending on the species of insect, they could have two, three, five, six stages of instar development. Each time they go from stage one to two or two to three, they shed their outer skeleton. Remember the exoskeleton. They shed that and they become more and more like the adult until the final instar sheds its exoskeleton and looks just like mom and dad. So why did I bother showing you all of this? Because whether we're talking about a good bug or a bad bug, it's often these immature forms, the larval forms or the nymph forms that do the good or the bad. And it's important that we understand a little bit about the life cycle of the insects because it helps us understand what's going on. Let me give you an example of why this is important. This is the monarch butterfly. Everybody knows the monarch butterfly. We love to have butterflies in our yard. They're beautiful. They have comfort, serenity, and they're just wonderful to have. If you look here, this long curving mouth part is called a siphoning mouth part. And the uh, butterfly puts it down into the flower and sucks out the nectar. That's where they get their nourishment. While she is doing that, she's standing on this flower. On the top of the flower, are all the anther, that's where the pollen is, the male part of the flower. And she gets the pollen all over her body and goes to another flower and pollinates a flower. That's one way flowers reproduce. The mature butterfly does no harm to the plant, but she lays her eggs. And her eggs hatch into a larva, which we call a caterpillar. Now, if you're doing milkweed, growing milkweed like this, so that you can help keep the monarch butterfly going, that's great. You want to see these caterpillars up there eating the plant. But there are other butterflies and other caterpillars that like to eat your broccoli or your lettuce or your tomatoes or your flowers or your trees. So in that way, caterpillars are not real good, but it's good to know the mature form does no harm. The immature form does lots of harm or can do lots of harm. Good to keep that in mind. So let's learn more about the enemy, the bad bug. And let me define some. Bugs are not inherently bad. They are bad because they eat our stuff. They eat our roses, they eat our lettuce, they eat our, our, our fruits. That's why I'm defining them as bad. So they're the guys that are doing bad stuff to your veggies and your fruits. So let's learn about them, let's learn about the good bug. And these are the ones that help control the bad ones. So let's let the good bugs do your dirty work. That's why I wanna make you think, as we go along, let's see if we can have an environment that the good bugs will do our work so we don't have to rely on noxious chemicals and so on. But if we're gonna do that, we have to define a level of tolerance. We have to ask ourselves, is a little bit of damage okay? Is a little bit of presence of a bad bug okay? Let me give you an example. I was working in a farmer's market table at Shadeless, a gentleman comes up to me with a jar full of those bugs on the left, those big jars. That's a pretty good size uh, uh, bug. That's about an inch long. And also a jelly jar full of the little guys off to the right. Those are the nymphs. Those are the babies. This is the adult leaf-footed bug. It's called leaf-footed bug because of this. Now, and he came up and he said, these are all over my blueberries. What can I do to kill them? We get a lot of questions like that at the table. What can I do to kill something? Well, I asked him, um, are you getting any blueberries at all? And he goes, well, yeah, I'm getting all the blueberries we can eat. Ah, oh, I see. How's the plant look? The plant looks great. So at that point in time, these insects were nothing more than an annoyance to him. They were doing no damage. Now, can they do damage? Yes, usually they don't do a lot of damage, but they could. But at that time, they were doing nothing but except being there. So we have to kind of, can you accept some of these insects as being there rather than they have to resort to some chemo, chemical to get rid of them? However, there's always a however. Sometimes you need to do more drastic measure. And that means uh, insecticides. 
And my plea to you, and we'll talk about it at the end, is use the least toxic alternative. There's some uh, insecticides that are not as bad as others. Let's try to use those if we have to use them. But how do we determine who is a good bug and who is a bad bug? Well, there's no real way to, to determine that strictly based on the way they look. Remember I mentioned the word elytra, that's the exoskeleton, that's the kind of shell over the wings. Well, here we have three beetles that all have brightly colored spotted elytra. If that was your criterion for goodness or badness, you would be wrong one third or two thirds of the time because this is a good one and these two ones are bad ones. Here's another example. These are called true bugs. There's actually one group of insects, all those gazillion insects I mentioned. Scientists like to put them together, like butterflies are different than, uh, than house flies that are different than earwigs, that are different than fleas, that are different than silverfish. So they put these insects in groups based on their similarities. And of all those 10 quintillion insects, they are all put into 30 different groups. They all fit into 30 different groups. One of those groups is called true bugs. The rest of them are not called bugs. They're called beetles or dragonflies. But these are true bugs. That's a little bit of useless information for you. But nonetheless, these are true bugs. And when you look at them, you can say, well, yeah, I can tell them apart. Their heads are a little different and their markings are a little different. But if you came up to me and you said, I have this gray, black, long bug with orange red highlights is it good or bad i'd have to say yes because this one's a good one this one eats other bugs this one is a bad one because it likes to eat box elder trees here's my last example <clears throat> this is an earwig most people know this they call them pincher bugs earwigs can be real pests especially to young or small seedling plants they can chew them up and destroy them pretty quickly. This is called a rove beetle. This is a good guy. It eats the babies of this guy, amongst other things. If you saw them, you see them here that you can distinguish them clearly. But if you saw them running along your in your flower bed, dodging and getting in their mulch and stuff, you may not be able to tell them just by the way they look. You kind of have to know them. But it's not always easy. That's my point. You kind of have to know them. And I'm going to going to help you at least with the common ones. But having said that it's sometimes difficult to know if a, a bug is good. Is this a good bug or a bad bug? And the answer is, like all Master Gardener questions, it depends. Because if you see this, here we see a praying mantis eating a fly. Most of the time, flies are not our pals. So we look at this and say, absolutely a good bug. But now we have this big pregnant female praying mantis. What is she eating? A honeybee. Well, if you're a honeybee fan, you might say, well, it's kind of a bad bug. Then we have this picture. This is a female praying mantis eating the male after they just mated. That happens about 30% of the time, by the way. Not a very fleet uh, uh, male, or he might have gotten away. This picture, by the way, was given to me this weekend by a woman at a mashed gardener table. She stopped by to look at that praying mantis picture I had up front, and she said she had one and said I was I was able to use them if I wanted to. So thank you, Sue Andrews, for allowing me to use your photo. And then there's this. There was a scientific study taken, undertaken oh, about three or four years ago when the authors were looking at the eating habits of praying mantids, and they were just short of 150 documented cases of a praying mantis taking a small bird, and hummingbirds were what they wanted the most. Is it a good bug or is it a bad bug? Kind of depends. Not always black and white. But now I am going to talk about ones that I consider black or white. I'm going to talk about the bad bugs. These are the ones that I consider the common pests that you have had or likely you will have this summer in your garden. Now, what do you think the most common insect garden pest is? I'll bet, I'll bet 75% of you are just saying out loud aphids. 
And you're absolutely right. That's probably the most common insect garden pest we have. There's about 4,000 species of aphids, 250 of which are actually of, uh, of importance to big ag or to us as gardeners. They, uh, they, some of them are plant specific. Some of them eat anything they can get around. Um, but usually you see a lot of them in the spring. Right now you see a lot of them. Uh, or in the fall, but also there are plant specific. So when the plant is up and growing, that's where you'll see the aphids. Have you ever wondered though, just looking at this one little area right here with just, you know, uh, five or 10 aphids. So you go out in the garden and you see this and you go out a few days later and you see this often induces a reaction like that. You're vexed or you're horrified. Have you ever wondered how is it that they go from just a few to so many? And they're just everywhere. What well, has to do with their life cycle, with their reproductive style? The females can reproduce without males. That's called parthenogenesis. They're not the only insect that does this, but they're probably the gold standard for it. Not only that, the female aphid gives rise to live offspring. That's not very common. And all the live spring offsprings are females. Seven, five to seven days later, these newly born aphids are giving rise to 12 female babies a day. Are there male aphids? There are. They usually are born in the spring. And then there is a sexual reproduction. And the aphid, uh, female aphid now doesn't give uh, birth to live young, but to eggs that overwinter on your fence or in the bark of your redwood tree or in the mulch below. So that when your uh, roses spring forth in the spring again, so do the aphids. So they're quite a resilient uh, uh, population of creatures. But what do they do? I mean, there's first of all, there's just a lot of them, but what do they do? They have what they call piercing sucking mouth parts. You see this little stylet type thing. This is a standing electron microscope where you see it uh, more clearly. They push this down into the plant and suck the juices out of the plant. That's why you can cause, they can cause leaf curling and they can actually, on little plants, they can actually cause the demise of the plant. They suck all the juices out. These juices are heavy in sugar, lots of sugars in them. But an aphid is like you and me. They need proteins to grow and reproduce and do whatever they do. Well, the juices in the plant are not protein heavy. So the, the aphids have to suck out a lot of juice to get the protein they need. And they have lots of this excess sugar. What do they do with it? Well, they have adaptations in their digestive system. So they excrete this excess sugar and it's called honeydew. And you can see it on leaves like this. You can see sometimes I've seen it in roses where the, the, the leaves just look shiny. The whole leaf looks shiny. And if you touch it, it's sticky. Sometimes their aphids are in trees and they drop their honeydew onto your car and your driveway and your walkways. It can be real messy. Now, honeydew does another thing. Honeydew is a perfect growth medium for a fungus called black sooty mold. It's not, it's just unsightly. It won't really kill the plant or anything, but it's unsightly. You see this on citrus. If you see this orange, you're not going to put that orange out on your table when you're having guests coming over. But the honeydew has another adverse effect, and it brings us to our second bad bug, and it's called the ant. The Argentine ant is that little black one that's all over your backyard that comes into your house sometimes. They are an invasive species. They've come up from where? Argentine, Argentina. And they come up and they are driving out some of the uh, natural bees and they're having other adverse effects. Now, I have to say there's some positive things that bees in general do as well. They eat dead stuff. They help aerate the soil. But I'm talking about the bad stuff that they do. And one of the bad things they do is associated with what the honeydew from the aphids. Here are some aphids. Here's an ant. And because ants feed on honeydew, they like it, they need it, it's sugar rich, and they also take it back to their nest to feed their young. As a result of that, you could say ants farm the aphids, and they do. They herd them, and they have chemicals in their feet and their legs and their mouth that tranquilize the aphids to keep them from running away. 
And once they have them herded, they use their antenna to stroke the aphid to induce the honeydew release that they take back to their nest. Well, what do the aphids get out of this? Well, they get protection because ants are particularly vicious. They will drive away or kill predator, good guy, good bugs, and I'm gonna talk about it in a few minutes. So if you have aphids, you likely will have ants and you need to deal with both of them. There are baits, boric acid that's available for ants. Aphids are somewhat easy to deal with. You can wash them off with a, a steady stream of water. You can use uh, horticultural oil or insecticidal soaps that are usually pretty good to control them. But if you get rid of the ants, usually the, the beneficial insects will take care of the aphids. There are other honeydew producing insects. One group are called scales. This is a cottony cushion scale, a brown soft scale, which is probably one of the ones that's common that I find in my own citrus trees and other places, and a black scale. When scales are small, when they are nymphs, when they are immature, they have legs. They crawl around and they find a place to settle down. They lose their legs. They develop this kind of shell over themselves, which protects them from some uh, predators and from some insecticides and so forth. And they sit there, they don't move anymore, but they suck the juices out of the plant like an aphid and they produce honeydew like an aphid and they are farmed by ants like an aphid. There are other honeydew producers that you may have the misfortune of running into, one of which is called a mealybug. Mealybugs get in all sorts of plants. They're particularly nasty on grapes if you're growing grapes. And they seem to have an adverse effect on uh, succulents. You see this Echeveria here and you see this kind of uh, nasty looking webby stuff down there. That's indicative of mealybugs. They get deep down into the rosettes and they're very difficult to get rid of. Uh, so there are, and they uh, suck the juices out of the plant just like the other bugs I've talked about. Another one is the white fly. These are adult white flies. They are not actually flies, they are bugs. They are true bugs like the aphids, like the mealybug, like the scale. This is the nymph. These are the adults, and this is what you often see on the underside of leaves. These guys suck the juices out of the plant. They produce honeydew. They're farmed by ants, all the same problem, and they're very difficult to deal with. You can use, you can wash them off. Uh, you can use oils and soaps. You'll kill the nymphs, but you won't kill the adults, and they'll come right back and lay eggs, and you have the same problem. They are very difficult to get rid of. Uh, sometimes you have to get rid of the plant, uh, particularly if it's a small plant like a bean plant or something that you can throw in your green can. White flies have intermediate hosts. This year in my backyard, for instance, the white flies were on weeds. So I pulled the weeds and got rid of them and that minimizes the population so that when they go onto uh, plants that I care about, like my vegetables, the predators can usually take care of them. The earwig is one I talked about earlier. The last two years has been a particularly uh, uh, common pest in households. Some people even claim they come into the house. They don't do anything bad in the house, but they do things, bad things to plants. They eat the leaves, they cut holes, they chew them up. And on small plants like seedlings, they can kill them. They live in the ground, but they can crawl up into plants. There are baits that you can use for them. There are traps you can make for them. The IPM website, which I will show you at the end, will uh, have details of how to do both of those. One of the strategies you can do for seedlings, if you have a small plant that you're going to plant in your garden, you can put, you can get a, uh, a uh, milk carton or something like that, or a plastic, um, a soft drink container, cut the top and the bottom off and make a sleeve and, and put the sleeve over the plant and the uh, earwigs and slugs and snails and other creatures can't crawl up into the plant. And then when the plant gets big enough, it can withstand some of the damage. So there are ways to deal with it. There are traps that you can make or, or barriers that you make can exclude these insects. There are a number of beetles that would be considered bad bugs because they can do damage to various things like our trees, like our vegetables, like our fruit, uh, like our ornamentals. This is a hopefully a beetle. This one likes to eat ornamental plants, particularly roses, but it likes white and apricot colored roses. In particular, if you grow a red rose, it's not so much of a problem. 
This one I put on only because it's an interesting beetle. It's called a snout beetle for obvious reasons. And it's only a problem if you grow cotton in your backyard, which you don't probably. This is the boll weevil. Usually beetles are hard to deal with because by the time you see the damage, they're gone. Now, there are some that you can see right now. The spotted cucumber beetle is out. Uh, the way you deal with it usually is hand picking them. You squash them if you're not squeamish. Uh, you can drop them off into soapy water and kill them that way. Insecticides don't really do much damage to the flying insects like this. So you have to hand pick them or try to exclude them with row cover on young plants, for instance, so the beetles can't get into them. Now here is the five spotted hawk moth, all that we call a sphinx moth. And there's two things you can see from this picture. First of all, the moth is quite large. And secondly, this person might need a manicure. But the moth is like the butterfly, has a siphoning mouth part. They, they eat the nectar from flowers. They do no damage, even big ones like this. But what she does do is lay her egg and her larva comes out looking like this. This is called the tobacco hornworm. Now, if it had a black spine here, it would be called a tomato hornworm. And they have some marking differently. They're functionally the same. You can have both of them here. This is a picture I took in my own backyard and I have the tobacco hornworm. They are very damaging to your tomatoes and peppers, particularly tomatoes. They eat the fruit, they eat the leaves, they eat the stems. And they don't just like to eat one tomato, they like to take a bite out of every tomato. They're hard to find especially when they're smaller. They're up in the, the canopy, if you will, of the tomato up deep in the leaves, hard to find. So the way you find them is to look for worm poop, little black or green uh, pellets. Gravity helps you because poops fall. When you see them on a leaf, look up and you uh, oftentimes you will find them. What do you do with them when you find them? They can be quite large while well, you pick them off. Wear gloves you, if you need to. You squash them, uh, you throw them in soapy water, you throw them to your chickens and throw them in the street. You step on them. Uh, there's lots of ways. Insecticides really don't do much for big guys like this. And when you pick them off, they don't like it. They regurgitate some green ooky stuff that gets on your hands. That's a defensive mechanism so predators won't get them. Uh, that just makes me angry and I throw them harder. Uh, but you need to usually hand pick uh, pests like this. There are uh, a wasp I'll talk about later, which will prey on these, but I've never seen that activity in my garden. This is the cocoon of the uh, hawk moth. And if you pick it up with this little handle, it wiggles. Chickens like that, but most people don't. If you grow apples or pears in the Bay or in the Contra Costa area or most areas of California, you will find you the, uh, the coddling moth. You will have the coddling moth. It's a very small moth, but as you see, it's about a half inch uh, long. They, most of them never eat in their lifetime. They just reproduce and then die. Um, they come out when the temperature is uh, 62 to 65 degrees. Uh, the sunset temperatures, they lay their eggs on the fruit or on the leaves or on the stems and the egg hashes, uh, hatches and the larva crawls and burrows its way into the uh, fruit. And you know that's happening because you see this. This is called frass, other known as worm poop. And the worm crawls down through the apple into the core where it eats the core. And you see this brown stuff is usually a fungus that grows in the frass from the uh, larva. And you see the larva. And then the larva, uh, when it's full, it, it crawls back out of the apple and down uh, the tree and to the ground where it pupates. Now, I horrify people often when I give this talk because they say there's nothing at all wrong with this apple. This and this and this are perfectly fine. You cut out the worm and all that brown stuff and it's perfectly fine for eating, for applesauce, for drying. Some people are aghast by that. But this is one of the examples of that tolerance. Can you tolerate some wormy apples? I probably have 50 to 60% of my apples are wormy, but I still use them for whatever I use them for. Because if you don't want a wormy apple you there are options you have you can bag individual little tiny apples bag them put a bag around each apple individually it's pretty labor intensive or you can do a spraying paradigm you have to hang out traps to find when the males are out 
Then you go online and there's a calculator based on temperature and number of days, which can estimate the most likely time when the um, larva are crawling on the surface of the apple. And then you spray them with an insecticide. The insecticide used often is called spinosad or sp spinosad. It's, it's used in organic gardening. It's very effective against caterpillars, but it can kill honeybees. So you have to be very careful with it. So you can do it either way you want. I find it easier just to have tolerance because the spraying is time consuming, very time consuming, not so costly, but time consuming and rigorous. Stink bugs are another interesting uh, category of bugs. These are true bugs. This is what you see. This is what you see after the stink bugs have been around. You see the discoloration in your uh, tomatoes like this. They, they can also cause damage to some fruit. And what you see are, these are the nymphs. These are the babies of the stink bug. And they are the babies of the green Southern stink bug, this guy. You see the big piercing sucking mouth part here. They put down into the, uh, um, even when they're little like this, they do it and they suck the juices out of the fruit. And you see these black markings. This is the site where they have been feeding. There's really nothing wrong with this tomato. You can eat that, it's perfectly fine. I ate, I ate a lot of them before I knew what this was. I don't think I look like this, like those stink bugs, but you never know. But there's nothing wrong, but it's just kind of, some people don't like the idea about it. Stink bugs are hard to control. If you have a lot of weed, a weedy area around your garden, you might find them in the spring. They like to start out in a winter in the weeds and then come over into your garden. So you, uh, you can, try to get rid of them by get ridding, uh, getting rid of weeds. Uh, if you find them, you need to just hand pick them, squash them, put them in soapy water, whatever your preference are. But insecticides don't really work against stink bugs. This is one that you may see right now. It's called a mass chafer. It's called a June bug. It looks just like that. It's a scarab. It looks just like that Egyptian scarab, except it's smaller and it's brown, where the uh, Egyptian scarab was black. This one has a uh, poorly developed mouth part, so it does no damage. It doesn't eat. It doesn't chew anything. It doesn't do anything bad. It just flies around. You might find them in your swimming pool or in your uh, uh, watering dish for your pet. Um, and they just want, but what they do is they lay their eggs, of course. And once again, the life cycle thing, their babies are called grubs. They are the larva of this beetle. And the grubs are particularly uh, uh, enticing to guys like this. Have you ever wondered why your lawn gets torn up some certain times of the year? Because these guys and skunks are looking for these. I got all of these out of one 13 gallon pot. It had a pepper in it that did quite well, surprisingly, but when I took the pepper out and took the soil out, this is what I found. There are ways to deal with it, with things called nematodes. I'm not gonna go into the details about that, but they are somewhat hard to get rid of. They can damage, these grubs can damage young plants and certainly can damage turf. That's, where you, that's why you find so much damage in your lawn because they're there and the raccoons want them. Now, this is my last bad bug. And when I introduced the bad bugs, I said, these are the pests that you have had or likely will have in your garden. This is the exception to that statement. I hope you and I never see this one. This is an invasive pest called an Asian citrus psyllid. That's what this is. This, she's a small insect. These are her nymphs. And this is the honeydew that they produce, just like the aphids produce, but it's very unique. And it's pretty ghastly looking if you get right down to it. Very diagnostic. You see this? Don't call me, call the state. Why? Because this is a very dangerous pest. Not because of this, this is just disgusting, but because the psyllid carries a bacterium which causes Huang Long Bing disease or citrus greening disease. It kills citrus trees over a period of five to seven years. The fruit's useless and bitter tasting. Takes a while to kill it. And this psyllid and the disease has almost decimated the citrus uh, uh, industry in certain parts of Florida. Is the psyllid and the disease in California? 
Yes, it is. Where in Southern California? Where else? The disease has not been found in Northern California, to my knowledge, but the psyllid has. A couple of years ago, pre-COVID, this was found in El Sobrante, Pleasant Hill, San Francisco, and Sacramento, the psyllid. No disease yet. The, the, the bacterium, uh, the disease is incurable. We have a big citrus industry in this state, so the state is very interested that we keep an eye out on this. Most everybody on this call, I bet, has at least one citrus tree. So keep an eye on it. If you see, it's very clear. It's very different than aphids. Aphids don't have this stringy looking stuff. Call the state. And they will probably they will either come out and manage the tree for you or tell you what to do. And I guarantee you they'll do it with rather harsh chemicals. So what have we done historically with respect to bad bugs? The ones I've talked about, the ones I haven't talked about. Keep in mind though, I, I, I forgot to mention this early, of all those billions of insects that are out there, only one to 3% of them are pests. Most of them are good guys or are neutral, but the pests cause a lot of damage. And this is, from Time Magazine, the year of my birth, I won't sing this for you because that would be just too hard for all of us to stand. DDT, I remember, is an incredibly effective insecticide. The problem is it killed everything else. It killed all bugs and it had adverse effects on lots of birds. And it was a really, really terrible chemical. Terrible in, 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 with respect to the side effects it had. There are lots of chemicals of this ilk, like DDT, that have been banned. But if you go to a garden store, you see this. There are lots of chemicals available yet. They want to sell you chemicals. And keep in mind that insecticides are designed to do one thing, and that is to kill something. So you need to use them very carefully. Not all chemicals are like DD2. There are some that are more benign, if you will. I'm going to talk about them at towards the end. There are some that are much safer, but there are still very, there's still quite a number of very powerful uh, uh, compounds, uh, organophosphate uh, compounds that can be very damaging to the good bugs and to other animals as well. We as Master Garden and, and others think there's a better approach to managing insect pests. It's called integrated pest management. And it's a strategy. It's a combination of techniques. And I, you see biological control is in red because that's what I'm talking about. But there's also how you grow plants, mechanical and physical controls. I've mentioned some of the traps and so forth. And if necessary, part of IPM are chemical controls. But use the least damaging ones if you can. And you use the chemicals after the other techniques have not proved to be effective. This is the IPM website. I'm gonna show you this in a couple of different forms towards the end in a way that you can access this. This is the site that we as Master Gardeners use to give you the information that you're hearing tonight. Get your smartphone ha uh, handy. At the end, I'm gonna show you how to access the site. You can do it with your smartphone. But let's talk about the biological control. Let's talk about the good bugs. These are your friends. These, but first of all, if you're gonna say, I want to bring in more good bugs to handle the bad bugs, you need to provide an environment for them. What is that environment? Flowers, it's a win-win. We all wanna grow flowers in our garden. And these are annuals, perennials, trees, herbs, anything that has flowers will draw in. Plant. And let me show you an example of why, how it does. This is a called a surfed fly. I'm going to show you something about this later. This is a really good bug. It's a fly, and it only eats pollen, the adults. This fly has its leg holding on to this filament. And the filament is part of the male part of the flower, and it has the pollen at this tip right here. It's called the anther. And right here at the tip of this red arrow, is the mouth part of this thing. For flies are called spongy mouth parts. And they are gonna, she is going to go down and eat that pollen. She needs flowers to sustain her. Then she lays her eggs 
and her eggs become larvae and her larvae eat aphids. I'll show you pictures of that in a minute. This is why you want flowers. You want flowers for other reasons as well, but it brings in the beneficials. Who are the good guys? Well, there are different categories. The pollinators really have nothing to do with the bad bugs. They're just good things to have in the garden. But these, the natural enemies of predators and parasites are the ones that take care of the bad bugs. And some insects can be considered neutral. Praying mantis, for instance, it can be good and it can be bad. Yellow jacket, believe it or not, can be good and can be bad. In the spring, yellow jackets pick up caterpillars and other soft-bodied insects like whitefly uh, nymphs or aphids and take them back to the nest. Later in the summer, though, they become pests for us. So some can be neutral. The pollinators are just beautiful things to have. We love to see them. This is the female carpenter bee. You see that all over the big heavy bee. This is the male carpenter bee. You rarely see these. If you do, it's a special treat. This one is, this is also a male carpenter bee. It has a different, it's a, a different version. It has black eyes versus the green eyes. These are special if you see them. This is a bumblebee, a type of bumblebee and the sweat bee. These are wonderful to have. These just are friends. They have nothing to do with the bad bugs though. But the gold standard in terms of a beneficial insect is the lady beetle. When I grew up, I called them, people still call them ladybugs. They're not bugs, remember, they're beetles. Nonetheless, we all call them bugs. And what is she doing? She's eating what I call the Cheetos of the insect world, aphids. See why they'd be called Cheetos? She loves to eat them. She lays her eggs on the underside of plants and they hatch into this. This is her larva. This is her baby. Baby eating the Cheeto. Loves to eat aphids. Most people don't know this. That's why you have to understand the life cycle of these insects, of some of them anyway. The immature forms are doing a lot of the work. Just last week at a farmer's market table, a gentleman came up and we were talking about this very thing. And we have pictures of this. And I was telling him about this and he was horrified. He said, my God, I've been squashing those because he didn't know they were good guys. That's why it's so important to understand the life cycle. They then, when they're ready to become adults, they pupate. They form the pupa, and about 10, 12 days later, out pops an adult to finish uh, their life cycle. Now, I'm going to show you a demonstration of how amazing this life cycle is, and it happened last year at our demonstration garden in Walnut Creek. This is, these are a couple leaves from a zucchini plant. And can you see the aphids, this horrible gray mass of aphids? Aphids were everywhere. You see them up here, they're darker. But what do you see here? The white arrows show adult lady beetles. The yellow area er, uh, arrows show the nymphs, the babies, the immature form of the lady beetle. And the red arrows show the pupa. The whole life cycle right here in one picture. And for no added cost, you've got a serpent fly right here. This is amazing that you could see this all on basically on one leaf. And what you saw a week later was this. You see all this white stuff? This is where the aphids were. There's still some aphids there. These are the exoskeletons. Remember I told you that when the nymphs um, change from one phase to the other, they shed their skeleton? Well, that's what this white stuff is. You might see that when you look at aphids on your roses. But look at what you see on this. Look at all the pupa you see. You see a mating pair of lady beetles here, and you see a yellow spotted lady beetle up here. But what an amazing view to see the whole life cycle of how these beneficials take care of the bad guys. Now, what was startling to all of us who study insects, there were no ants involved in this. Usually you do see ants involved with aphids. Had there been ants, you would not have seen this picture because they would have killed or driven, they would have driven off the adults, killed the larva, and the pupa would not have been there. But it's just amazing. The beneficial insects do a remarkable job if you let them do their job. Here's another beneficial insect. It's called a green lacewing for obvious reasons. You see how beautiful their wings are. They fly around kind of erratically and they eat on honeydew. Remember, honeydew is uh, from the aphids and other soft-bodied insects. They occasionally will eat an aphid, but they lay their eggs on these delicate stalks. 
But where did they lay them? They laid them at the aphid buffet, the Cheetos right here. See them? They hatch into this. Now, if you saw that on one of your flowers, you would say, that's not good. But it is good. That's why it's important to understand these life cycle things. This is a voracious eater of aphids. The ground beetle is a friend. If you have a compost pile, you have these guys all over the place. If you have mulch, you have this growing, uh, crawling around the mulch. They crawl up, they uh, crawl. They crawl up the uh, side of your redwood trees and hide in the crevices and eat insect larvae and pupa. This is her baby. Now talk about not looking like mom. Look at that, and look at the mandibles. These are the mandibles. Just another name for the jaws. They use the mandibles to eat insect larvae and pupa. These are definitely good guys. If you see this black beetle crawling around in your garden bed, don't step on it. He's doing you a lot of good. These are the serpent flies. Remember I mentioned the flies? They're called hover flies. They are tiny. They're, they're half an inch or less, and they hover over the flowers, just like a helicopter, and then they zip over and hover. Go out tomorrow. If you have flowers in your garden, go out. You will see these. They are all over the place. These are flies. They are not bees. They kind of look like bees because they're striped, but they're flies. They only have one pair of wings rather than two. These two are eating pollen. This guy looks like it's excited about getting ready to eat pollen, but they fly around. They hover looking for what? Aphids. And when they find them, they lay their eggs. And this is the larva. And the larva decimates the aphids. This is a picture I took in my own rose, uh, rose uh, garden. You see all the aphids. You see the exoskeletons of the aphids here, the little white things. And this is the larva. In my garden in the last two years, these are the most beneficial of beneficial. I see a few ladybugs, but I see mainly serpent flies. And Okay, I would, I would scrape these off or wash them off a little bit, but I basically let the beneficials go. And within a week, they decimated the aphids. 100%? No. No, there's always a few aphids, but they get down to a reasonable number that I can scrape off or wash off. These are a wonderful, good guy. Soldier beetle is another one you may see. When I, before I was a master gardener, I'd see these on the plants. Guess what I would do to them? Yeah. I would squash them or do something to them. I didn't know they were good guys. And they're good guys because they like, now tell me you're not thinking about Cheetos now. See, that's why I call them Cheetos in the insect world. But they're Cheetos in the insect world because everybody likes to eat them. Soldier beetle loves to eat aphids. And her baby, this, looks nothing like mom, likes to eat immature insects and insect eggs. So it's win-win. The adult eats adults, the baby eats babies. It's a great one to have in your garden. These are my last good guys. These are the wasps. If I said wasp to you, you'd probably think, uh-oh, yellow jacket, hornet, one of those ones that puts a bad sting on you. No, these are parasitic wasps. These are little tiny guys. There's thousands of different types of these guys. They're less than a quarter and sometimes much less. Do they have stingers? Well, not to us. You'd call maybe that a stinger and that and that and that. They don't really sting any. They're not stingers, but you know what they are? They're called ovipositors. They're how they deposit their eggs. And where do you think they deposit them? Inside bad guys. Here's a parasitic wasp putting her egg in this caterpillar. On the right side of your screen, you see a caterpillar about to have a very bad day because this parasitic wasp is just about ready to lay an egg. And this is a classic picture, I think, of a parasitic wasp laying its egg inside an aphid. So what happens when these, when these eggs are put into a host? Well, the eggs hatch into larva, and the larvae start eating the inside of the host. They grow. They keep eating, they grow, they form a pupa inside the host. This is a parasitized aphid. Think of the alien movies. It's just like the alien movie. The wasp is developing inside, and when it's fully formed and ready to go, it chews its way out through that hole, and that's called an aphid mummy. Think how small that wasp has to be. People who would use broad spectrum insecticides to kill these aphids would kill all these wonderful wasps. 
that not only prey on aphids, but they prey on scales and mealybugs and other insects. So I've shown you pictures. Some here says the Regents of University of California. Okay, does it happen in real life? Does it happen in your own garden? The answer is yes. This is a picture I took last year of the bottom side of a, a leaf of a red bell pepper. I went out and found a bunch of aphids. I went out a week later to pull it up and throw it away. And I turned the leaf over and I saw this. All of these are aphid mummies. All of these are parasitized aphids. You see the hole where the uh, wash came out. There's one here that's not that still has legs, the aphid, but it's fully parasitized. There's only one maybe aphid that's, that's uh, uh, alive here. Next time you have aphids in your garden, if you're not squeamish, turn over the leaf and look at it closely. Even with the naked eye, you can see that. You can see the aphid mummies. And I bet you'll find, maybe you'll have a lot of aphids that are not uh, parasitized, but you'll find aphid mummies in there. It's really remarkable that these creatures are helping us out. So what can we make of all this? I hope you're intrigued by, by the interest, the fascination, the beauty of these. I mean, look at this. How can you not be fascinated by some antenna like that? It looks like I like, maybe I am nuts. Who knows? Anyway, these insects are beautiful and they do wonderful stuff for us. So what are my take home messages? Make beneficial insects feel at home by providing what you want to, flowers. Annuals, perennials, this is a tree. This is a Palo Verde tree. And this is a big giant um, carpenter bee flying to that. And other insects go to that. Flowers, win-win for you. Make them feel at home. Give them what they need to sustain them so they can provide something to kill the bad guy. However, biological control can take a, a little while because they have to lay their eggs. The eggs have to hatch. So there, you may see an upswing in pests. But once they get going, you have these remarkable changes. Now, as I said, do you get rid of 100% of the pests? No, that's the tolerance. You have some left, but not like what you had before. And the however is, sometimes the pest population gets unacceptable. It does. Sometimes we have to use insecticides. We just have to. But if you do, there's, there's a number of them that are benign, and I mean benign to you, to your children, to your grandchildren, to your pets, and to the environment. The oils, neem oil, most everybody knows neem oil is from the neem tree. Stylet oil is, happens to be my personal favorite. It's a mineral, all it is is mineral oil, and the oils have emulsifiers added to them, so they'll, uh, you can dilute them in water and spray them. They and the insecticidal soaps they cover the insect and insects grow or breathe through holes in their side. Spiracles are called. And the oils and the insecticidal soap clog up those holes and they suffocate. They are very benign thing. The UC tells us to not recommend you make your own insecticidal soap because not all soaps are equal. They can burn your plant. Go buy one, they're not expensive. These are the way to handle most of the sucking insects. The beetles, I said, are, are difficult, but the aphids, the mealybugs, the, the uh, white flies, use the oils and the insecticidal soaps. Can they hurt some beneficial insects? Yes, they can. Because if you have a, a larva of a beneficial insect, it would suffocate too. But usually when you have to resort to insecticide, the pest population or burden is so high, you have to accept some collateral damage. There's also some very specific controls you can use. There are uh, people now with the biology the way it is, they're using bacterial products to make very specific insecticides, Bacillus thuringia gensis, or however you say that, Bt. If you look for Bt, it's on the, on the uh, insecticide bottle, but it controls specifically leaf feed feeding caterpillars, like the ones that hit your broccoli or your cauliflower. They won't damage anything else. BTI only controls mosquitoes and fungus gnats. There is a granulosis virus that you can actually spray to control coddling moths. I've never used it, but these take, you have to spray more often, so it's more costly and more rigorous and turn time consuming. There is one that's very commonly used. I mentioned it before. It's used in, or it's approved for organic gardening. It's called spinosad or spinosad. 
and it controls what you can read here, but it can harm insects or uh, uh, bees. So be careful and read all the details about how to use these if you're going to use them. This is the UC IPM site. This is going to give you all the information I just gave you the last hour and more. You can type it in your browser or you can use your smartphone right now on that QR code and you can access the site. I'm going to show you what the site looks like now, but I'm going to show you a slide just like this at the end if you want to use a QR code or type it in. If you use the QR code or type it in, you will get to this site. This is the IPM site. This is what we as master gardeners use. We don't do ag stuff. The big ag is completely different. They use different insecticides and so on, but you use this one. You click anywhere on this square and you will go to this page. Lots of stuff here. I encourage you to look if you want, but right now you just click over here on a thing called pest notes. Or you can type in, uh, um, I don't see it on this, uh, on the previous page, there's a, a, a search uh, a window that you can use too, but you click the pest, you get to this, the pest notes, you click the pest notes and you get to a page like this. This is just one page. You see all these things in alphabetical order and you get a PDF of ants, aphids, uh, uh, the citrus psyllid and others that I didn't talk about. And it talks about their biology, how to manage them through IPM or through non-chemical means and how to use chemical means, which ones to use. And it's not only the insects, but it's plant diseases, weeds, uh, vertebrates. You get a lot of information here and you can get all, you can look yourself at how to manage these pests. If I haven't talked about them or you need more information. This once again is the site and this is the QR code. And I encourage you to look into it. There's a lot of stuff to read. There's a lot more information than I've brought up, but it's worth your time to look into it if you're interested in trying to learn more about the pests that are tormenting you in your garden. Now, so I thank you for your attention, for you letting me part of your letting me be part of your Tuesday evening. I hope you learned something about insects in general. I hope you will give the good guys a try. And I think you will be happy that you did.